Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues, my name is Bobo Lowe and I have the honour and pleasure to moderate what I think will be a most interesting and stimulating discussion on a highly topical issue, namely Western attitudes and policies towards Russia. Now, to discuss this subject, we have an excellent and diverse panel. On my immediate left is Sir Roderick Braithwaite, formerly British ambassador to Soviet Union and then Russia, and the author of many books, including most recently, Armageddon and Paranoia, the Nuclear Confrontation since 1945. To his left is Aglaya Snetkov, a lecturer at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies, um, at London University and co-editor of the Russian Analytical Digest. To Aglaya's left is Domitila Sagramoso, lecturer at the Department of War Studies at King's College London. And finally, we have Edward Lucas, previously a senior editor at The Economist, author of The New Cold War, and now senior vice president at the Center for European Policy Analysis in Washington. Ladies and gentlemen, Western policy towards Russia today represents, in my view, a most confusing picture, rife with contradictions. We have the most pro-Kremlin US president in history, and yet US-Russia relations are worse than at any time since the mid-1980s. Europeans are thoroughly divided on Russia with a number of countries openly sympathetic towards the Kremlin or lukewarm in their opposition. And yet EU sanctions against Moscow remain firmly in place and NATO is more cohesive and assertive than it has been in years. Many in the West see Russia as an essentially malign actor, yet there is a growing trend asserting that it is not Russia but rather China that poses the bigger threat to the so-called liberal world order or rules-based international system. And they call for a pragmatic accommodation with the Kremlin to meet this existential challenge. So the question I want to put to our panelists and also to you in the audience is where the West goes from here in its approach towards Russia. I would like us to focus less on how we got here, who or what is to blame for the current crisis in Russia-West relations. And I really want us to focus on what are the main challenges today and how should we go about addressing them? So to set the ball rolling, I'll ask you, Roderick, to deliver some remarks, please. Thank you, Bobo. I'm going to... Um, I hope it fits in with what Bobo said. I'm going to start with a couple of quotes to set the, st the scene, or rather the extremes, of the argument. One is a piece that was in the Times on the 3rd of May. And the Times said on the 3rd of May, when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, few could have anticipated that the main threat to national security, and they meant British national security, nearly 30 years later, would come from another hostile regime in the Kremlin. And the other quote, or rather adjectives from, a, from, a, from an article, is from something that Ed Lucas wrote in the Times on the 8th of February. And he said, and I agree with him, not the Times, he said, most commentary about Russia, I'm just picking out words he used, is simplistic, alarmist, preposterously alarmist, marked by cliches, caricatures, and hysteria. So that's the... Now, the tone of the debate that we've all been having for the last, I suppose, probably since, roughly speaking, 2003, the arrest of Khodorkovsky, perhaps 2005, I think has been characterized by an excessive emotion, a great deal of indignation at the, at the actions of Russia, the indignation is perfectly understandable. In my view, it clouds judgment, and it's useless as an analytical tool. And on that 
point, I'm going to talk about what Edward calls other people also, what about her? It's, you know, you, an American criticizes the Russians and the Russian says, what about the Negroes in the southern states? Well, those sort of comparisons I think are useful. I think they are an, an analytical tool. Um, it's not a question of moral equivalence, which is what is often said. And you can say it's a, a form of the meta-assessment that Andy Marshall talked about. You, you balance these things against one another and see where it nets out. A fact. It's a fact that since 1945, the West has interfered in more foreign elections, uh, overthrown more foreign governments, invaded more foreign governments, and killed a lot more foreigners than the Russians have ever done. Now, you can think what you like about that. It is a fact. You have to balance it against our moral indignation about what the Russians get up to. Um, the point really is in my view, that Russian activities are reprehensible, but actually they're not all that unusual. That's the sort of thing that people do. I'll come back to the question of where that leaves us as far as policy is, is concerned. But I'm going to talk about the threat, what the, briefly. What is the threat? Well, there are various aspects of that. First of all, the, at, the, at the most optimistic estimate, Russian defense spending is about a quarter that of the USA. It's about a third that of China. It's two thirds that of India. Those comparisons, those, that's at PPP rates, so that's probably the best comparison. Hybrid warfare, well the Russians didn't invent it, we, not, it was invented years ago, probably find it in Thucydides. They are good at it, but they're certainly no better at it than we are. We have perfectly competent, as we've shown recently, uh, defenses against cyber attack and ways of finding out what bad people have been up to. Now, the Russians, if I were a Bolt or a Pole, I would see a direct, possibly existential threat to me, to my country. I think that's perfectly understandable. Why do we bother about it? We've fought only two wars against the Russians in our history, and each time it was because we had invaded Russia. Mm -hmm. So what are we going on about? Um, what are the Russians' assets? Well, their size. It's a huge country. They're people. They're resilient people and ingenious. They have sophisticated armed forces. They do. Nuclear weapons, not to forget, but they have huge weaknesses, a small population economy. So my strong view is we shouldn't, you'll tell me if I'm going on too long, we shouldn't underestimate them. Of course we shouldn't, but we shouldn't overestimate them either. The overestimation of Soviet force, Soviet political stability, Soviet economic prowess was one of the great mistakes that the Cold, our Cold War analysts made. Now, how much time have I got? About a minute. Okay, very quick. <laughs> Policy is what you want to talk about. I, I think you need to be realistic, not indignant. So I think that our reactions to Ukraine and Skripal were perfectly sensible ones and probably near the limit of what we were actually capable of doing. We were not going to be able to push the Russians out of Crimea or East Ukraine. So we strengthen NATO and our allies in the East. We uh, develop it and are developing our cyber capacity. And importantly, I think we have, it's turned out that we're not prepared to make unsustainable commitments mm -hmm. to potential allies, Ukraine again, because if we did, we'd betray them. Yeah. We, as we betrayed the Poles, as we betrayed the Bolts, we shouldn't take on. Well, look, Russians are cross about that. So what do they expect? I shall omit one bit, but I shall just say one thing. Mark Galeotti has just written a book. Uh, we should talk about Putin. And one of the things he says is the more we talk up the Russians, the more power we give Putin. And he advises us to laugh at them instead, as the Russians themselves do, for example, over the Salisbury affair. If you look on the internet at the Russian jokes, they're hilarious. Thank you. Roderick, I just wanted to follow up a couple of things here. If what about real, what about is, in, is legitimate in some way. Do we just say, well, look, the past is, you yeah, know, we just forget what they do. We, we call it a sort of value neutral. Both sides were in the wrong. And therefore, we need to sort of just be pragmatic. We need to crack on. Or, and, and the second issue related to that is, yeah. are you saying that really they're not, they're not a threat? So why are we so obsessed by them? I, I'd say much more subtle things than either of those things. Uh, I mean, I mean, uh, you, you know, of course, there's a values issue, 
Uh, and of course, I'm glad that I was in the West rather than the East during the Cold War, and the end of the Cold War came out the way it did. I've got absolutely no doubt about that. I have no doubt where I'd prefer to live. I'd actually prefer to live here rather than America. But if I had to choose between America and Russia, I no doubt, and I love Russia very much, but I know where I want to live. So that's the first point. Yeah. Uh, your second point was... Uh, is Russia a threat? Well, are, are we, I, are, if you're saying it's over, we're overestimating the threat, should I, we just basically say, look, it's not a threat. It might be a rogue, but no, it's not I a threat. I don't think it's a rogue. I think it is a threat. And what I mean by that is I said... If you're in Eastern Europe, of course it's a direct threat of an old-fashioned kind. Yeah. And uh, I had a long argument with Warren Yeltsin's political advisers about uh, NATO enlargement in 1995. Yeah. And he said, why are you enlarging? We're not going to invade Poland. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't think you are going to invade Poland, but the Poles don't know that. Yeah. And that's actually very important. And that's what all the trouble with NATO and the Russians, a lot of the trouble with NATO and the Russians, probably due to the fact that we... Uh, we tried to pretend that NATO wasn't an alliance directed against Russia. Why did the East Europeans want to join NATO? That's its reason for existence. Going into Iraq turned out not to be a very good function mm -hmm. for NATO. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, I'm going to give somebody no, no, else a time. No, thank you. <laughs> Aglaia. You can speak from there or you can come sure. up to the, whatever you prefer. Thank you very much, and um, thank you very much for starting off the discussion, Roderick. I think that was very interesting, and I think my take on it is similar, but I guess slightly extends it, that um, I think that there are a number of issues, if you sort of take the title of the talk more literally in terms of Russia watching, that um, there has been so much, um, such a lively debate so much discussion about Russia. And there has been so many pieces written that, you know, I used to study an obscure subject, and it has just risen and risen up the agenda. Um, and even when I started doing this many years ago, um, I absolutely did not expect Russia to be constantly in the headlines. And I think that there has been, a lot of people have, have talked about the concern that there has been so much hyperbole and so much multifaceted debate that actually trying to figure out that question and having a reasonable debate is very difficult. And that you are very quickly side and position within a particular yeah. camp. And actually trying, so, um, some people, I would say, have positioned themselves and made a career out of uh, wanting to sort of kick out the headlines. Some have tried to position themselves as more reasonable kind of um, talking heads. But I think that is, a, that sort of, a topic of Russia is no longer a discussion of, a simple discussion of foreign policy. Mm -hmm. It has become more than that. And I think that's one thing that I think we need to um, keep in mind when talking about Russia and the West. And I think in that sense, there is also, and that's something that I would say has changed since Ukraine specifically, also since 2016, is that it used to be a simple discussion of foreign policy. And to some extent, you could have, I would argue, much more of agreement, let's say within the EU, but even within, between the EU and the US about Russia. Now, you could be positive, and you could argue that in the early 2000s, it was much more of a cordial relationship, or it could be much more negative, and we have Munich. But it was something that was happening up there. And we could think about norms or principles or reactions to crises, and um, there was a, a, some sort of a Western position. But I think that what has changed in the last, since Ukraine, um, and since Skripal, and since... Uh, U.S. elections is the extent to which it has now become um, a conversation about Russia is a conversation about ourselves and about domestic policy. And this has exploded this subject and made it much more complex. And therefore, discussions about how to get unity between NATO, within NATO on Russia is precisely that problem, is that um, NATO members themselves, within themselves, have very different positions and you have very different groups. And I because I edit a, a, an online, a, a bi-weekly publication on Russia that is edited um, by colleagues from the US, the UK, Switzerland, and Germany. I ask them what they think about Russia and the West in each of their countries. And for example, my German colleagues very much said, you know, it used to be easy. <laughs> um, there was the left and there was the right, and we knew which politically, which way all the experts and the answers to this question went. And by now, it is so split. City U is split, the socialists are split, the Greens are a little bit lesser. Um, and I think that what Russia therefore makes us think about is what our own red lines, 
domestically? What are the red lines in terms of foreign policy? How do we react to questions of Facebook? How do we react? So they, they exposed these questions that we never considered that would have anything to do with Russia. Because Russia used to be Russia and NATO or Russia and energy, and those were the topics. Um, and that makes it very complex. Because all of a sudden, um, it makes us about, yes, what do we think about our own information security? Um, and those are sort of cutting edge questions that we don't know ourselves. But so, to finish up, I think what it also reminds us is that we no longer live in the world of the Cold War. We know that. But the difference is that whereas before, foreign powers used to be a question of, as I said, foreign policy. By now, it's domestic. It is about what do we do with China within our domestic realm, what we do with Russia within our domestic world, realm. Do we do business? Do we allow um, technology coming in? Um, <coughs> and that makes it interesting, but it also makes it much more complex. So are you saying that our dealings with Russia really, in a sense, is holding a mirror to ourselves? Because what I was going to ask you is also, are we in a way using Russia, and not just Russia, China, certain non-Western countries, as a kind of easy option to evade responsibility for our own failings in the West. I mean, we talk a lot about rules-based international order, and yet others would say, well, hold on, what rules-based international order? You, you break it every, every day of the week. So how, what, what is your reaction to that? I mean, so oh, well, do we use Russia as an excuse, basically? So I think I would answer that with say, with, in two ways. So I think on the one hand, we definitely use it as a scapegoat. Yeah. And enough people have criticized the discussion around Brexit and mm. Russia. And I will not get into this debate, but one could argue. Um, and I think that has definitely been utilized and it has become a symbol for something else. I think that in the US, often it becomes a symbol for a party political discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the other element, and I think in that sense, the, the metaphor of a mirror is useful, is that they actually show us things that we haven't thought about, okay. La, such as cybersecurity, right? It's not sure. about whether Russians use it, right? But who else can use yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which we don't know the answer. What are the limits of our own rules? Like, who do we want to include and exclude? So they, I think the interesting thing of using Russia is also as a thinking piece. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. Right. And there I would. Domi, let's bring you in at this stage. Thank you, and good evening to everyone. Um, two years ago, I participated in an uh, Intelligence Square debate where I made a case in favor of uh, bringing Russia in from the cold. And uh, after two years of additional, very thorough research on Russia's actions in what we call the near abroad and uh, the far abroad, I'm still of the view that despite, or maybe because of Russia's behavior very assertively in many areas, uh, we still need to engage in some kind of very firm, and I underline the word firm, dialogue with Russia on issues which are of key relevance to us. So I'm still very much of the view that we should not isolate Russia, but we should just uh, try to find a way of a meaningful dialogue on issues uh, which are uh, of very much importance. And those range, of course, from arms control, uh, nuclear non-proliferation, uh, international terrorism, climate change, and of course, issues of regional security, many of which cannot be resolved uh, without Russia's participation. Uh, I'm thinking about issues of non-proliferation, and that th thinking about Iran, North Korea to a certain extent. And of course, when we think about European security, it cannot be issues related to enhancing European security, cannot be resolved without uh, taking Russia into account. Uh, and of course, uh, the problems around Ukraine, the annexation of Crimea, uh, potential sort of uh, additional hybrid warfare in the Baltic states, meddling in elections in Europe, uh, support for right-wing parties, efforts on undermining European security. In a way, they all refer to Russia. So I think Russia is, as always, sort of part and parcel of our security discourse. Um, I think we have, in our, in our understanding of our relations with Russia, you know, we've really moved away from, we've long passed this phase of sort of integrating Russia into the West. Uh, efforts are developing a strategic partnership have also 
uh, it, it failed and led nowhere. And I think now we find ourselves in this situation when we are much more handling Russia in the way of sort of damage limitation, trying to minimize the impact of Russia's actions without a clear strategic framework of how or how to handle Russia and what to do about Russia. Uh, there is a lot of emphasis on sort of strategic patience. Uh, I'm of the view that this static position uh, can sometimes be very dangerous because it can sort of cement our disagreements. So my emphasis, again, is on trying to engage with Russia in a sort of meaningful and selective dialogue on issues which are of great relevance and where we really can move forward. Um, I'm certainly not in favor of sort of cutting bargains, sort of Venezuela versus Ukraine. I think that is extremely dangerous. I'm very much in favor of upholding very clearly our red lines in terms of principles and values, but also in terms of what refers to our own security and prosperity, uh, efforts to undermine NATO, to undermine the European Union, and I think really go to the core of our national interests. And when I say our, I'm thinking of Europe generally. Uh, I think that the dialogue must really involve trying to find solutions to issues which are of great relevance today. And when I think about arms control in particular, with the INF Treaty, countries having pulled off, the CFE Treaty as well, problems with the New START Treaty uh, being uh, expiring soon, I think it's very important to find common ground and also to develop some kind of confidence building measures along the borders of Russia and the Western NATO in order to avoid some kind of accidental confrontation. I think the, the dangers of escalation are very strong. And when you talk about people in Russia, they are very worried. We seem to ignore their worries. And I think that will be to our peril. So should we fundamentally change our approach? No, I'm not really talking about that. I think we generally should stay firm. And I agree with Sir Roderick in many of our decisions that we have taken. Uh, I think under a different set of circumstances, I would have argued in favor of a much broader sort of discussion on European and international security issues of the kind we conducted in the 1970s when we engaged in a very sort of effective dialogue with the Soviet Union around the Conference of Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, which led to the Helsinki Final Act. I think today uh, that is difficult to achieve. Uh, not, not necessarily because of what is happening in Russia, but what is, what is happening in the West and the lack of, of strong American leadership. Uh, in the United States, we have a leader who doesn't really support and enhance multilateral uh, negotiations and doesn't really value global institutions. So I think it's very hard now to find the kind of cooperation and dialogue that we would uh, hope would, uh, would have developed. I'm of the view generally that you cannot build uh, European security excluding Russia. So in some way, we need to find a way around it. So if I have a few minutes to conclude. No. Uh, you're, uh, <laughs> I want to ask you a question, yes. though. You talk about the need to engage with Russia. Yet what does engagement mean? When people talk about Russia's legitimate interests, what are those legitimate interests? Because for a lot of people, when they, when they hear engagement, it's just another soft word for a kind of appeasement, give the Russians what they want, when they want. How do you respond to criticisms like that? I'm not talking about appeasement. I think that no, no, negotiations doesn't, does not necessarily mean handing in. I think sitting down, finding agreements on arms control. But that, if, if that, you can't find agreements, what, you're just saying, you need to have the dialogue first. I think you have to sit down and start the dialogue. At the okay. moment, we don't even have a dialogue. And right. I think that we need to understand what the is issues are of concern to Russia. And I think that every country, not just Russia, has legitimate interests in the countries around it. But to what ensure does that mean? What does legitimate mean for you? Interests that make sure that the country doesn't suffer, for example, from a blockade in trade, okay. that it doesn't feel that right. its own security is being undermined, that it doesn't feel that uh, it is under threat okay. from its neighbors. So I think that, uh, I mean, I think we should not demonize this idea of legitimate interests. Okay. I think we should right. think about them in terms that every single country has them. And this so seems a perfect moment to bring <laughs> Edward in at the stage. <laughs> Well, thanks very much indeed 
very, 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 I was crossing off points that I wanted to make because you were making them as well. Um, I, I need to apologise in advance that I'm going to have to leave a little bit early um, for another, another meeting. Um, so I'm not running away from the discussion, whichever way it goes. Um, uh, but I also, I think we have to, look, my first point is we have to start here from a position of humility. Because we, the Western Russia watchers, have largely got this wrong. We were warned back in the 1990s that there was a problem developing both domestically and in Russian foreign policy, and we didn't listen. We didn't, not only didn't listen, we patronised and belittled the people from Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, the Czech Republic, Ukraine, and indeed Russia itself, who warned us about this. So we don't have a great record. Instead, we've had a series of wake-up calls. Uh, it started off perhaps with the wake-up call over energy, um, I remember back in the um, early noughties being laughed at in the German um, economics ministry when I said we need to worry about our gas dependency on Russia. They said, are you really saying seriously, Mr. Lucas, that Russia might use gas as a political weapon? We know how that ended up. And there have been many more wake-up calls. There was a military wake-up call, which we had with the Ladoga and Zapad exercise in 2009, um, which really scared us, and the result is we've, um, we've, we've made changes um, to NATO's contingency plans as a result. We've had the cyber wake-up call. We've had the wake-up call over so-called fake news and disinformation. Again, people used to laugh at the idea that Russia would be able to conduct information operations um, in the West. Nobody's laughing now. Um, we've had Salisbury, and before that, Litvinenko, so people are no longer think it's amusing and fanciful, the idea that Russia might try and physically eliminate its opponents in the West. And now, as the European elections are coming up, we are seeing um, the effects of Russian political warfare within our Western political systems. We have parties such as Mr. Salvini's party in Italy, the AFD, many parties in um, other countries, which have alarming links to Russia, links that have been cultivated over the years. And in this country, Russia is now a tier one national security threat. That would have seemed absolutely laughable a few years ago. But I think we could, it'd be fair to say that we are now more or less awake. But as, as, as Roderick right, right, rightly pointed out, Russia's still weak. If you take the Nordic Baltic Nine, five Nordics, three Baltics and Poland, um, they spend more on defense than Russia does. So clearly this is not a contest of means, it's a contest of willpower and coordination. And that's where Russia has the edge. Russia's willing to accept economic pain, we're not. It's prepared to take risks, we're not. It's prepared to lie about um, what it does, and that's why um, it gets places. I'm in favour of indignation. I think indignation is very important. Um, change happens when people are scared and when they're angry. Also sometimes happens they, where they're greedy. I would say in our case it should also happen because we're feeling a bit ashamed. Um, Ukrainians have died in their thousands as a result, partly, of Western mistakes. Yeah, we promised in the Budapest Memorandum that if Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons, it would not be subject to economic coercion, coercion and its borders would be sovereign. That paper was, that promise was not worth the paper it wasn't written on, and we are partly responsible for that, as are the other, other signatories, not least Russia. So I think a bit of um, emotion is important to concentrate our minds. Um, but when we concentrate them, we should be, I think, obviously, there's a complete straw man here. There is no shortage of dialogue with Russia if the Russians want to talk. There's umpteen <coughs> mechanisms. They tend to walk away from these mechanisms. They're there. The problem is not of lack of dialogue with Russia. It's lack of um, willingness, I think, on the Russian side um, to accept that other countries have legitimate interests as well. Um, but the main target of our indignation, ire, shame, and everything else should indeed be our own weaknesses and chiefly dirty money. Um, this is the biggest um, weakness of the Putin regime. When they steal money from the Russian people at home, they don't keep it there. They launder it in offshore and onshore financial centres, and the biggest of those onshore financial centres is here in the city of London. And we've done pathetically little to deal with that. We had a lot of promises from David Cameron, very little action, but there's a long, long to-do list, and we've done only a few things on that. But we should also worry about technology um, as well and the way in which our... Um, social media and other platforms can be, um, can be used um, against us. Uh, final point, because I'm sure you're dying to ask me a question, um, <laughs> is that I, I think we should get away from this idea, the, the what about tree is interesting, but you know, Ukraine did not breach the rules-based international order. They are a victim of a breach in that. This is partly about our own security, and here we can weigh out our own shortcomings and so on, but it's most importantly about the security of our allies. They are the ones who are, are literally in the firing line. If we believe in international alliances and international solidarity, then it is to the Ukrainians, the Balts, and the others um, that we owe our first duty of maintaining their security. 
Thank you very much, Ed. When you say indignation, what worries me is that indignation or whining has become a policy, a surrogate policy, an excuse for doing essentially nothing very much. And that perhaps one of the problems that we have in our relations with Russia is we don't really know what we want from them. And we don't know, we don't really go in uh, hard in pursuing our goals, maybe because we just don't know what they are in the first place. So a lot of Western policy perhaps suffers from, well, frankly, being all very half-hearted. What do you think? Well, I agree. I think I mean, there was, I think, some was photographed walking into Downing Street um, when sanctions were for the umpteenth time under discussion with a bit of paper which said, but this mustn't affect the city. Yeah. And, and yeah, we're, we're all in favour of, of, of tough talking, and we're not in favour of doing things that involve difficult, painful trade-offs and decisions. Exactly. And if we were to say that foreign dirty money is not welcome in the City of London, our economy, you know, this ghastly phrase, UK PLC, would take a hit. <laughs> I, I think we should take that hit. I think yeah. we should be saying to the Austrians and the Liechtensteiners and the Luxembourgers and actually to Delaware and Montana and all these other jurisdictions, if you don't say who owns the companies that are registered in your, your jurisdiction, um, their business is not welcome here. We could say you can't buy a flat in London. You can't sell a flat in London. You can't rent a flat in London. Perhaps even you can't own a flat in London. Mm. Yeah, we could do that. The other countries have done things like that. We could do it too. We just don't want to because we're lazy and greedy. Okay. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I'm going to now open it out to the audience. Um, two rules here, please. Could you please give your name and affiliation? And the second rule is almost more important than the first, which is no multi-part questions or interventions. You've got one shot at the title. <laughs> Sir. <laughs> yes, you okay, yep. no, no microphone. Excellent. Uh, no, a microphone is on its way here, just here, a third, a third row here. Uh, thank you very much. I won't use the parade ground voice. Uh, Noel Hadjimichael, member of the Institute, and yes, another Australian in country. Um, panel, Russian social and maybe soft power, are they more courageous, are they more corrosive, and are they uh, more committed than we are, do they do British Council more arrogantly and more effectively? Okay, hold that thought. You, sir, um, over there, about first row and second bunch. Uh, thank you very much, um, Ewan Grant, um, former law enforcement intelligence analyst and a survivor just of um, European Commission shenanigans in addressing the threats against Ukraine. Um, my question is mainly for Ms. Sagramozo, but for, for all of you. Um, you mentioned about um, Rush, the need to take account of Russian public opinion and its fears about the West, re that they have concerns about what they see as risks from the West. You did say that. Um, have you, have we ever, have any of the panel ever asked the Russian public about what they think about rich Russians having all their money and assets in the West? Because if we're so bad, it does beg the question okay. why that money is here. Right, sir. Charles Spencer, uh, no affiliation to speak of. Uh, am I naive to be indignant about the very concept of the near abroad? These countries are sovereign, they are UN members, and three of them are even members of NATO. Okay, nice and brisk. Um, so, Roger Hamilton Martin, I'm a freelance journalist. Um, given the current state of the polls, um, <laughs> we may be in for a Corbyn government within, in the near future. Um, what does the panel think we could anticipate, you know, from that government with respect to Russia um, and 
you know, his, his foreign policy? And would that be good? Would that be bad? What, what, what should we uh, anticipate? Gentleman at the back here. Thank you. James McLeod, member of the Institute and not an expert at all on Russia. A word that has hardly been mentioned is Putin. How much is we, are we talking about Putin and how much are we talking about and his policies and, and aspirations and how much are we talking about Russia as a country? Okay. Right. So I'm going to take the first round. So we have Russian soft power. Have you asked the Russian public about their risks, that the risk the West poses? You've got the near abroad, how appropriate is that term? What a Corbyn Russian foreign policy, what a Corbyn policy would be on Russia, and Putin or Russia? Who'd like to get, well, Roderick, Well, there, there, are all, there are a lot of very interesting, guilt and indignation. I mean, of course you need emotions to get things done. I was talking about indignation as an analytical tool, which it's not. Uh, dialogue, there is a lot of dialogue going on. I mean, look at the way the Americans and the Russians don't shoot one another's aeroplanes down in Syria. But it's below. The, 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 all sorts of questions up, but the specific ones, Russian soft power. Everybody loves Russian culture. It's never been much used to the Russians as a political tool, and it still isn't. And they spend a lot of money on it. I think the whole Facebook stuff, the whole Russian influence on election stuff is overdone. They may devote a lot of money to it. How effective it is, we don't really know. I suspect it's not very effective. Um, a Corbyn government, anybody who thinks they can predict anything about British politics uh, <laughs> at the moment, I would be very interested to hear. Putin, I think that's a point I would like to have brought up. Putin is, is, of course, all sorts of things. He's a very cunning politician. He's intelligent. He has a rather cold sense of humor. Whether you like him or not, sort of irrelevant, because that's not what foreign leaders are there for. Uh, he's given the Russians what they want. I, I, of course, don't presume to know what the Russians want, but all the polls show that he's given them what they want. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what else should a leader do? As for the future of Putin, I mean, Putin's going to die. He's going to leave <laughs> office. And he, he will go by one means or another. I'm not prepared to predict the future of that. But I, I do think that we focus on Putin too much. Putin is not Russia, whatever his uh, sycophants say. A lot of what we, problems we're having with Russia now, we would have had if Putin had never been born, in my view. Aglaya, yeah. yeah. why don't you? So I, I, I will not obviously answer all, the, all of them. Exactly. I'll just pick a couple. Um, yes. I think in terms of Russian soft power, I mean, I think uh, I would say that Russia does have soft, soft power. Um, and I think that it, there used to be an assumption that only the West does have yeah. it. Yeah. And yeah. that's, I mean, patronizing and naive. <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. And somewhat racist. The assumption that no one outside the West should have soft power. Of course they do. But that doesn't, but in this idea of categorization of who's got more is a bit childish. Um, because there's an assumption there's a winner and a loser. But I would follow what Mark Gagliotti's been talking about increasingly, which is what his term, not mine, which is dark power. And I think that's something the Russians are really good at. Um, <laughs> excellent. Uh, because they, are, they, they, they love to be a villain. And they like to sell themselves as a villain. They get others to attract it to them as this villain. And I think, that is, um, that, I think that's the power they really do have. Um, I think, when, I think the only thing I would say in terms of the Putin in Russia, to follow, I completely mm. agree with what Roderick said. I think to follow up, the difficulty to some extent in this whole Putin versus Russia, and I, here I guess I speak as a Russian, but also as an analyst, which is in terms of the political class, it's just been such a long time. Mm. Yes. I mean, mm. I'm, like, mm. it's, it's just, a it's a dec it's, it's, it's two decades, right, yeah. more or less, mm -hmm. um, of a regime. We have no idea what a different regime would be. And I'm not mm. saying that this would be better or worse. It's just been so long. I mean, not to Absolutely. be flippant, you know, it's a bit like Ar when Arsene Wenger left Arsenal, right? <laughs> that bad? <laughs> no, but it was that long. Um, and therefore, it's very hard to predict. So when people say that it, Russia would be a much better country without Putin, or much worse country, yeah. Yeah. I would argue that we have very so, little knowledge. Sure. Um, okay. Don't mean. 
Um, I, I'm, I'm of the view that it would be different if, if there was another leader, and I think that often the Medvedev interregnum is sort of, uh, sort of uh, pushed aside as, as being irrelevant, but if you look at the nuances, they were there, there were uh, changes in policy approaches, so I think I'm of the view that uh, it would be different, and I'm of the view that Putin does have a project. Uh, regarding the so-called near abroad. I'm not saying I agree, I'm just saying that's the way that the Russians talk about their neighbors. Uh, I, I think I, I was maybe not clear enough as saying that our engagement with Russia should be really uh, very much clearly uh, upholding our principles and our values and our liberal system. In no, in no, uh, in no way would I argue in favor of, of sort of handing in and making bargains. I think I, I reinforce sure, that. Fine. I mean, you, you say project. What do you mean project? What is his project, if he has a project? I think his project is, and he talks very much about this, sort of Russia and the former Soviet space as a common civilizational space, okay. uh, where we share a common humanistic and economic and legal um, realities. So, uh, I, I mean, a part of his Eurasian project uh, and is, is really an effort to, uh, I wouldn't call it sort of restore the USSR, but certainly rebuild an area where Russia is predominant. Okay. And his emphasis also, I think, globally is very much on the emphasis on state sovereignty over sort of pooling of sovereignty as we have in the European Union. So within Eastern Europe, he's very much following uh, actually an idea that was first developed to a certain extent by uh, Gleb Pavlovsky when he talks about uh, Yevra Vostok, so the yep, European okay. East, this alternative okay. view mm -hmm. of, of uh, an alternative Europe to the European Union. And I think he is trying to portray himself as the leader of a conservative movement in Europe, and he has very strong okay. allies. Okay. So I think that he has a project. Okay. Uh, how strong and effective his soft power or dark power is, I think is debatable, but I think it is there. There is an attempt. Right. Uh, and uh, and uh, to the question regarding public opinion, I'm, I, I haven't really argued uh, for or against public opinion. I, I, don't ha I haven't okay. looked specifically at that. I, I know that uh, there is generally, uh, at least in terms of foreign policy, strong support for Putin. I think today, okay. with the economic realities, the situation is different. It's like, we have Putin, but we are not very happy, right. but we have Putin. So. Okay. Ed. Um, near abroad is a revolting term, and we should put it in the same category as Lebensraum. And um, I, uh, it's not, um, it, sh it should not, 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 not be used. Um, Russian soft power, interesting question. I think the, the project is bogus, and it's extremely counterproductive. They, Russia, Putin has turned um, Ukraine, which was perhaps the most friendly country towards Russia, um, into a country that no longer wants to have um, canonical ties between its church and the Russian Orthodox Church. It's a stunning, it's a stunning defeat. And as with many things that Putin has done, they've looked they're tactically clever and strategically stupid. Um, Russia is a cultural superpower, um, and it's tragic to me that this um, regime doesn't actually exploit that and use it, which it, which it could to um, make the country's reputation better. The um, Russian public opinion is extreme. When I asked Navalny about this when he was in London, I said, people say you're anti-Western. He said, of course I'm anti-Western. It's in the West that the regime loots all the I mean, uh, uh, invests all the money that it loots from the people of Russia. If you stop um, acting as receivers of stolen goods, he didn't quite use that phrase, then we will be very happy to be pro-Western. But we've destroyed a lot of our, our soft power in Russia by our complicity with the kleptocracy and are willing to be, be their bankers. I don't think we should over-personalise Putin. These problems predate Putin, as I said at the beginning, and they'll continue afterwards. There's a fundamental problem about Russia's relationship with its neighbours and whether it wants to be a post-imperial country, and there's a fundamental problem about the way Russia is run and the relation between wealth and money and the secret services in Russia. And as long as you have those problems, um, it doesn't matter whether Putin or Medvedev or whoever else is on top. And finally, I would just say that this is the longest period of stability and rising living standards in Russian history. And it's not surprising that many Russians after the 1990s breathe a sigh of relief and say, um, we may not think this is brilliant, but it's certainly better than it used to be. Um, that doesn't mean that the regime couldn't change very quickly if there was a, a, a shock. And I would be cautious about predicting um, stability. Yeah, OK. Lady in the third row here. Can I correct myself? Yeah, sure, please. I just want to correct myself on the soft power point, because actually, Aglaya was right. I, 
I was being too narrow. The way the rest of the world, we are very introverted, we Westerners. The way the non-West world looks at Russia is, is very different. A lot of things we care about, they don't care about. And a lot of the things that Russia projects, they find interesting. So I think, I think that was an important point you made. Okay, great. Lady. Mm. Claudia Hamill, member of Chatham House. Panel has talked a lot about we and us and our. I'd like you to define whom you mean by we, us and our. We talk about Europe, uh, the UK, England, Scotland. Who are we talking about? NATO. Great question. Gentleman far left there. Up, right in the front row, right at the end. Thank you. Dominic Caratu, member of Chatham House, a non-money laundering banker. <laughs> um, just to be clear. On that theme, are we best to look at Russia through the prism of the Cold War or as a mafia state? Okay. Lady in the middle row there, can you just raise your hand there? Sorry, yeah. So. Hi, student at King's College London, a master's student. I was going to ask, what are the panel's predictions for? 2024, when Putin um, finishes his presidential term, do you envisage something similar to the situation in Kazakhstan, where Nazarbayev has mm. um, is still holding the reins of power um, but, uh, after leaving the presidency? What, do, what are the predictions there, and how should the West respond to that uh, in the next few years? Gentlemen in the third row here. Uh, Chris, uh, my name's Chris, another student from King, uh, King's College. Um, my question is that, um, well, basically, I think with Russia and with the Soviet Union um, and the West, it's always been a case of a security dilemma, mm -hmm. where by trying to make ourselves more secure, we actually make a bigger threat when what originally was there. Sure. Um, I think of like the arms race, where by increasing our military spending to bankrupt yeah. the Soviet Union, you create like a huge military threat. Um, are, are we still doing that in any other situations with contemporary Russia? Um, like, by our intervention, are we actually making ourselves less secure, making a problem? And um, gentleman in the middle row there. Thank you, Chatham House member. Do, does the brazenness and openness of GRU active measures betray almost a willingness to get caught by the West? <laughs> Excellent. All right, so the questions are, who are we, us, our, mafia state, Putin succession, or maybe sort of Putin as Deng Xiaoping or Li Kuan Yew, uh, security dilemma, and GRU brazenness. Let's start with you, Edward. The we is really tricky because there are lots of different we's. There's we, the European Union, which is economic security. There's we, NATO, which is military security. There's we, the countries that run the world financial system, that's a different category. So I think you have just have to choose whichever we um, you find most appropriate for the uh, problem in hand. Um, I, I love this question about Cold War when it fits together with yours. I think that there's a difference. In the Cold War, we were facing a peer adversary. The Soviet Empire was basically roughly the same size as us. And secondly, there was a very clear hermetic divide. You didn't have Soviet com companies listing on the London Stock Exchange and putting members of the House of Lords on their boards. Um, you, had arm, you had Arm and Hammer, and that was pretty, mu pretty much it. So we are now dealing, and this is true in spades with China, with a country which is both hostile and deeply integrated into, particularly in Russia's case, into our financial system, in China's case, um, into everything. And that makes it, that makes it a lot, lot more difficult. Um, I don't think that this idea of the, the arms race is particularly <coughs> relevant because we are not trying to build up our forces, and despite what Russian propaganda says, there is, there is, NATO has no aggressive forces on the Russian border. We have 1,000 British troops in Estonia. Um, we have very small deployments in Latvia, Lithuania, the, and, and Poland, which are really there as tripwire forces. This is like what we had with West Berlin um, during the Cold War, just to make sure that a, 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 enough people from enough countries get killed if Russia invades, that they think twice, uh, twice about doing it. So I, I don't think that's a that's, um, really re uh, uh, helpful thing. And, I, and I'd be very averse to taking seriously these kind of manufactured Russian hysterics, where the Russians say, we need to talk about demilitarizing um, the countries on our borders, which they, means you take away your tripwire forces and we'll move our forces a little bit further back inside Russia. And that would be a, a lethal um, mistake and would be sacrificing um, the security interests of those countries. Tommy. Um, 
Well, I'm of the view that Russia tends to give a very strong value, or tended at least strong value, to arms control agreements. And if you look at the history of the CFE Treaty, uh, they generally, of course, there were problems with the bases in Moldova and in Georgia. I mean, they generally really try to abide by them to ensure that NATO would abide as well. So I'm of the view that there is, uh, there is a lot of uh, room there to negotiate effective arms controls agreements, and I'm of the view that they are very relevant. Uh, and I'm talking not only about uh, strategic weapons, intermediate nuclear weapons, but also conventional forces in Europe. I think that they are really at the basis of our uh, security structure, and I'm not arguing in favor of uh, you know, unilateral disarmament, not at all. I'm talking about negotiations uh, where we see that we also advance our own interests. So I, I strongly argue in favor of those. And I think that it's very important also to understand the perception, because from the Russian point of view, there is a perception uh, that uh, they are in some way engaged almost in a conflict with the West, whether we like it or not. And how we respond, you know, is important. And to just ignore it as something that is out of hand and, and exaggerated, you know, ends up finding ourselves in the kind of situation we found ourselves uh, with Ukraine in, in 2014. So I do think that the problem is that what lies at heart is the security dilemma and the fact that after the end of the Cold War, we really couldn't find a system of European security which in, in some, some way included Russia. And I know we are not allowed to talk about why we are what, where we are, but I think that's part of the problem. Uh, and, and, you know, the solution must include in some way uh, a, 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 um, an arrangement where Russia feels it's not being left uh, to one side what because it's not... What's the OSCE? The OSCE is not necessarily a security arrangement which guarantees the security of all countries. At the moment, it's more of an instrument of conflict management. So, uh, Domi, are you asking for a, you know, a revival of the Medvedev new yes. European security architecture that, that died a death 10 years ago? I think ago? we could have sat down and talked about it. I'm not saying yes. we should have okay. agreed. I think talking doesn't mean agreeing. No, this no. is the big, big difference, you know. We All can right. sit down, talk, and see where are our problems and how we can resolve them, because I think the reality in which we find ourselves today is not ideal. So it, obviously something went wrong. But it's part of the problem is we understand each other's positions. We just fundamentally disagree. The problem is not really one of perception. It's just that we have divergent policies, divergent interests. Isn't that the problem? That is part of the problem, but we had those during the Cold War, and we still could manage to reach agreement on fundamental problems on okay. arms control, for example, Fair on enough. borders, recognition yeah. of borders. Again, I'm yeah. in no way arguing in favor of recognizing the annexation of Crimea. All the contrary. No, no, no. I think this is why it is so important, and I think that to have an aversion to sit down and talk when we did that with a much more aggressive adversary during the Cold That's War is my point that we couldn't sit down and start a dialogue, a, com a real conversation about you know, how we want to organize European security so that everybody, not just mm -hmm. uh, Russia, everybody feels safe. That's a fair point. Uh, Aglai. Um, so I think, to, I, think, I think the question on the who are we is important. Um, and I have been living in Switzerland for the last 10 years, and I'm very mindful of the difference between the we being Bern, <laughs> For me, or being in London, and I, since I guess Brexit has taken place, I very every time I would come to Chatham House, but also I swear I would always ask sort of, but what's the London position? And people would were talking about Russia and the West was like we, and I'm like, okay, I got the we, but what is the London position? I think there are multiple we's, and I think it is by now we need not to label capitals, but I think actually there is it is important to now talk about Berlin, Paris, Bern as the mediator. And I think it is crucial that London works out its own position yep. and not hide behind the we, Fair because yep. that's the position yep. of the UK out of the EU. Okay. Um, so I think on that, I would absolutely. Um, I think in terms of the Cold War mafia state, um, I, I mean, I, I, would, I would argue that to some extent, uh, particularly within Europe, Russia is a regional problem. And therefore, it's absolutely not like the Cold War. Um, but I think also, we have to keep in mind that ultimately Russia on a regional scale is a difficult actor, but I think we have to take away to some extent the specialness. 
that it's either one or it's the other or you know yeah it's a difficult regional player and we have to deal with them they're not going away they are not what we'd like them to be Mm -hmm. But there are many mm -hmm. other regions where, frankly, and I'm not going to label India and Pakistan or other regional issues, where, frankly, people deal with it. And yes, it's a difficult partner. That's what it is. Okay. Um, I think in terms of the 2024 predictions, um, <laughs> my prediction on that is that I guess this is the five years before the election that we're going to start talking and making, <coughs> predi making predictions. Okay. And last time around, that's the, we had two or three years of everyone predicting. And I guess we're back into the space where, because right. at the moment it's very hard to tell. Okay. Roderick. Well, uh, the, everybody's made the point about we, because one of the things that the British have a problem with is that they no longer know who they are. And uh, <laughs> now, this, is a, this is a serious point. And I think the point about London, you know, yeah. Brexit is driven by the English. Yeah. It's not the, by, driven by the British. And I think you have to keep mm -hmm. these. I, I always reach my gun when I hear three words, we, strategy, or legitimate. There's always something <laughs> behind those words which is dubious. I want to talk about two other things. First of all, the security point. The idea of a European security conference was first put forward by the Russians in my personal experience in the 60s. I think it was put forward before that. It's a perennial uh, Russian position. And it's, if you're Russian, it's perfectly understandable. If you're not Russian, you get involved very quickly in the attempts that we made in the 90s to bring Russia into NATO without giving them a veto. The fact is that because of the size of the countries involved and the military power of the countries involved, you only want one big power in an alliance. Yeah. You know, you bring the other in and you're shot to pieces. Mm -hmm. And it, I think I'm all in favor of dialogue and the things that Don Michello was talking about, but there are some things that actually are not going to work. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of them. Mm -hmm. On the GRU, well, I spent also a certain amount of my career dealing with the KGB, <laughs> but not the GRU. Uh, the KGB, we used to negotiate about their ceilings in London, and we had, you know, there were actually quite interesting talks in the dark world going on about that. The GRU always managed to keep itself out of them. The GRU never signed up to an agreement that they put a ceiling on their people in London. Yeah, one, of, uh, yeah. one of the great things from my point of view about the Skripal affair was the first time the, Skri the GRU had been driven out into the open and were humiliated, and it couldn't have happened to a nicer bunch of people. <laughs> <laughs> All right, final round of questions. Lady in the, over there, just wave your arm around. Yeah, okay. Hi, Christine Michalajic. I'm not American despite my accent, so that doesn't color my question. Um, but, well, Mr. Lucas uh, mentioned that Poland Eastern European states were quite right about things that London was wrong about. And insofar as Russia is a European problem, a local problem, um, shouldn't we, whether that's London, Switzerland, or Europe as a whole, do a better job of listening to the enfant terrible on the eastern border, i.e. Poland, when it comes to Russia? OK. Lady at the back there. Just stick your arm up. Benita, Russia analyst. Uh, my question is, basically, you've just said we, this magic we again, um, and Russia understand one another's positions, but to what extent do you think that's actually accurate? Because it seems to me that there's a lot of, a lack of understanding in the West about what Russia is and what Russia wants, and we kind of perpetuate these stereotypes, a lot of them quite crass and dri derived from the Cold War, about what Russia actually prioritizes. Okay. Uh, the gentleman there, just in the front row here. Robert Gardner, Chatham House. We've spent all this time talking about what we see as we look at Russia. What do you think Russia sees when they look at us? <laughs> Great question. Yep. Right. Uh, the gentleman there, please. Walter Langreff, uh, Chatham House uh, member. Uh, it's a NATO-specific question, um, and it's a bit of a counterfactual, but if NATO had not promised uh, Georgia and Ukraine eventual membership at Bucharest in 2008, would have, what would have happened differently? Oh, great question. Um, gentleman there, just the same row. Joseph Garbuni, member of Chatham House. Uh, 
in 2012, <coughs> during the election campaign, during the debate between Obama and Romney, Romney talked about Russia as being a strategic rival or something, and Obama laughed at him, and all the media agreed. And suddenly, two, three years later, it was like that was the enemy. Mm. What happened? Yeah, gosh. Um, I'm going to slip in a couple more questions. So if you've got anyone else? Yes, sir. Just over here. Hello, Jeff Nunn, Ministry of Defence. Um, the panel early on in the discussion mentioned the word paranoia. Um, and I think a, a good example of Russia's potential paranoia is um, their opposition to NATO's ballistic missile defence system. Um, I wonder the, the panel's view on how much that paranoia has influenced their um, foreign and military development policies. Gosh. Right. Okay. So we have uh, Eastern European perspectives. Do we really understand what Russia is? How do the Russians see us? Uh, Russia is a strategic rival and defense policy. So um, Ed is gone. And that's unfortunate. <laughs> Why don't you start? Okay. Well, I think on the question of listening, I mean, one of the things looking back on my career was how seldom I listened rather than spoke. Uh, I was taught too much and I didn't listen enough. And you do listen. Actually, if you listen, you can hear useful things about what the Poles think, but also about the Russians think about Poland and Ukraine. What those people think of one another is actually very interesting and elided from most of the discussion. We didn't... I'd listened to Poland. I'd lived in Poland. People didn't listen. Partly, I think one has to understand the thing about the 90s was that we all were in a state of euphoria and hope that somehow or other we'd stepped out of history. I, I think that wasn't an ignoble position, mm -hmm. but, you know, we all, and the Russians, everybody realised that actually the same old problems were there in the slightly different guise. So I think uh, it's not true that we didn't know anything about Russia and that the Poles did. We all did, but uh, we live in different parts of Europe. The Poles felt differently about it from what we felt. That's the first point. On, on the question of... of um, well, it goes together. What, what have we got here? On the question of um, basically what we think of one another, um, paranoia. Uh, I strongly believe that both sides suffer from paranoia. Yeah. The Russians certainly do, but we do too. And that was the history of the Cold War, and it's a history now. The Russians are afraid of us. One of the things which uh, I think was an important change in the Cold War was Reagan's realization in the winter of 1983 to 4. He wrote in his diary, the Russians turn out to be terrified of us. I don't know why, because we're not going to attack them. Well, it's the same answer I gave to Yeltsin's advisor. Of course, we knew we weren't going to attack them. The Russians didn't know that, and vice versa. And so we constructed this architecture, which to some extent still operates of mutual deterrence. When Russia was falling apart, Gorbachev's diplomatic advisor said to me, the only reason you're going to take us seriously in future, because we've got nuclear weapons. He was a liberal and a very good man, but he was right, actually. Russia may not have a very powerful military force by most standards, but it has got a strategic nuclear force, which is rather efficient. So have we. So we're both yeah. rightly paranoid about that. Right. Okay. Um, so I um, a couple of points. So I think when it comes to listening to Eastern Europe, um, to follow up from what Roderick said again, I follow. It. Like, I think the other point to add is, and I think this is where, in terms of red lines and being more honest about what we want, to some, it's not that we don't listen, right? It's just not on the agenda. And to some extent, and because I'm not a politician, you know, let's be honest about it, right? It's not that people don't know that there are, certain, there are concerns in certain capitals in Eastern Europe. The question is, is how high is it on the agenda? Yeah. Is there basically sufficient political will to do something about it if it's costly or actually has to be debated or whatever? Which is fine, that's politics. Politics is politics. Which is why a crisis happens and often we are crisis reactive. That isn't because we didn't predict, it's just we didn't exactly. care. That's mm -hmm. fair enough. Mm -hmm. But, and I also understand that politicians can't say that. But I'm, I'm not sure that it's that people don't know. There is enough yeah. uh, going on between capitals. Um, I think that, and I'm going to try and put the questions of understanding Russia West, what they look at us. Mm. And this is very much coming from, as a Russian, mm 
Sorry. Um, I think that's... So I, I was always surprised. So I think that something I think is important to understand from the Western point of view, I would say, <laughs> is the, ex the level of double think, I would argue, there is at the level of the regime. Insofar as, on the one hand, this is a question of paranoia and being anti-Western, whilst, and this is having lived in London and Zurich, uh, whilst, you know, being very happy to shop in Zurich and sending children to the West. Mm. So I think there is a level where we, so that the, and from a point of view of Russian public, they are well aware of that. And I think because this doesn't take place the other way around as much when it comes to the West versus the Russians. I think we often kind of, if not forget, but we don't think of that. But I think what is sad is I would argue the Russian public is currently quite paranoid about the West, actually. I would say probably more to some extent than the leadership who are, you know, sojouring in the West, um, whereas the ordinary Russians can't afford it anymore. Yes, I, I was wondering, I mean, I can, I can see where you're, you're going with the Russian public attitudes, the apprehensions about the West. But sometimes when I look at Russian leaders, they, they look at particularly European leaders and they think you're weak, you're decadent, Europe is clapped out, it's a good holiday camp, but it's really, it's nothing special. There's no threat here. You know, you're, you, you, you guys are venal and corrupt and we have nothing to fear from you. What do you think? Uh, I think from a Europe point, point, so I think if you're talking about Europe, that's absolutely correct. It's a nice pension destination for when they retire but yes, ultimately it's about the US and ultimately the Russians are well aware that the West is on the way down. The person you listen to are interested in is the Americans and then you think about China. Yeah. Europe is important as a so trade. So not China first. But China has, in a sense, is starting to set the standard for, for the Kremlin elite. Or do you think that's uh, over, overstretching things? To here? some extent, and uh, this is quite, um, I would almost wish for the Russians to take China, if not more seriously, but actually sort of, but no, I think the Russians continue to be more obsessed with the West than okay. it's potentially Fair healthy enough. for them to be so. All right, Domi. Um, yes, I mean, going back to the, the, the question of paranoia, when you speak to Russians uh, sort of on a regular basis, you know, to commentators, I mean, they, they really, they, they really are very worried about a potential mm. confrontation mm. and mm. an escalation. I remember when there was a potential clash in Syria uh, after the, the, the whole chemical weapons issue. So there is a general concern that there could be some kind of accidental escalation. Okay. That yeah, is why okay. I put a lot of emphasis on the need to, to reduce tensions yeah, because exactly. I constantly okay. get yeah. the perception that uh, these, uh, you know, regional conflicts, be it Syria, be it Venezuela, be it Eastern Europe, could escalate. And, and I think that is very much ingrained and it's, it's driving a lot of the thinking and it is, it is very much pumped by, by the media in Russia, by television, a lot of the TV programs, they, they emphasize uh, this risk and they give a lot of space to the new kind of weaponry arsenal that the Russians are building. Uh, so I think that this is something that, that is why I put so much emphasis on the need to avoid any kind of accidental escalation. Yep, sure. And, uh, and I, I think it's, uh, the, the question of China is a very interesting one. And there is one question we haven't really discussed in detail and we probably have no time but that is uh, obviously the impact of sanctions and to what extent are they working and uh, from my research you know it is showing that on the one hand many oligarchs are, are coming much closer to the Kremlin so the individual targeted sanctions are not separating uh, oligarchs from the Kremlin but at the same time they're becoming a lot more reliant on support from the Kremlin so there is a, a growing process of nationalization of industry That's as a result cool. of sanctions and secondly it is pushing uh, you know the the Russian economy to a certain extent towards Asia to obtain uh, Asian investment so increasingly uh, there is there is a, a growing reliance on China Korea even Japan okay. I was told is becoming an important investor circumventing part of the sanctions so Sanctions, I, I'm of the view they're, they're working in, in the slow, long run, um, yeah. but in the short run, they are producing this particular dynamic whereby the Russian economy is increasingly in state hands and is moving towards China. But did Western policies have an option? 
you know, if you're a policy maker, you, there's immense moral and political pressure yes, for I, you to I, introduce I, sanctions. I, I, so you can't, you don't really have a luxury. You may think sanctions may not necessarily change Russian policies. But I don't what think we do had an have? option. I don't think we had an option, and I'm not of the view of of, of you know of increasing sanctions. And uh, you know the conversations I have with Russians is that they're extremely worried about the new potential DAXA sanctions. Okay. You know DAXA, right. the ones that could come in, you know, against individuals in the Kremlin and their families. And uh, and uh, I, I I mean Ed is is gone now, but I think it's very interesting to look at the Russell case where mm. we see, for example, when you know, sanctions against a particular industry or, or company in a very strong sector of the Russian economy, like aluminium, was going to affect sectors of the global economy, and so they were pushed back. So it shows that we are <coughs> eager to do something about Russia. We are paying the price in certain sectors. The European economies have suffered from the counter sanctions. Okay. But are we ready to go really far to the point where they really make an, a more immediate impact? All right. Which leads nicely to my uh, concluding question to the three of you. What, as we look forward, what is your one <coughs> concrete recommendation for Western policy? If you had to suggest one, one critical step, I want it to be a relatively specific one. So I want it to not just to be dialogue or engagement, but pick something. Um, Tommy, why don't you kick no. off? <laughs> Can I pick two? <laughs> Please, OK. Special dispensation. <laughs> <laughs> I think more generally, we really should work to uphold the international liberal order and the rule of law internationally and to okay. put an emphasis on moving away from power politics and realism towards you know, an emphasis on the rule of law internationally. And that includes, as I say, working immediately hard on issues of international security, and that includes arms control. And your specific recommendation? To work on negotiations on that. And uh, to arms keep, control, you yeah, mean? I mean, there are a variety of issues, but I think this is one where if we stay where we are on what I would call you know, military and cyber deterrence and sanctions, if we keep those in place, we, you know, which I am in favor of, of keeping our policies in, in line and then sort of try to engage on issues of emergency arms control. So should we, uh, so we start off by extending the START agreement by five years until 2026. Is I that think a, that, that could that be a good work? start. Okay, Aglaya. So um, I guess my number, well, I would say that uh, my recommendation to London would be to work out the London line, and I would be very okay, the London line. position and on what it what? is on its policy towards Russia, and I would be very interested. I think specific. I think pick, I pick think something. Uh, no, I mean I think I would literally say that actually there needs need to be real, a realization that basically, like Home Alone, what is it that they think in terms of recommendations. I think from the London point of view, they have to be very aware of this duality between wealth coming into London versus impact in terms of foreign policy. And I know it's unrealistic, but. Okay, no, that's a very fair point. Roderick, take well, it away. I told you I wouldn't necessarily follow your instructions. <laughs> uh, first of all, I, I, I want to say how much I, how important I think the point that Aglaia made about the way politicians take decisions. Politicians can cope with one and a half problems at a time. They're like Gerald Ford. They can't chew gum and walk along a chalk line. And that's because we know, because we're not stupid, what's going to happen in five years' time. But what we actually have to deal with is what's going to happen tomorrow. And that, I think, scholars often lose sight of, and commentators. It's very hard to deal with things that you know are going to happen, because you've got other things that you're doing. And I think that's part of the problem. The first thing. Um, the second thing, I'm sorry that we didn't have time, that we didn't factor in China, because I do think mm. that what is happening in the world today is affecting the positions of all of us, and that is the rise, of, the irresistible rise of China. Yeah. It's no good the Trump saying we're going to stop all that stuff. That's just ridiculous. And we haven't sufficiently factored that. We're getting paranoid about China too, and I yeah. also yeah. disagree with paranoia. <laughs> paranoia. We never answered the question about ballistic missiles. No. The, the ABM systems. Can I just yes, quickly say that? I mean, I think that the Russian fear of the West's position on ballistic missile defense is not irrational. Okay. 
I think that you can, you can say it's exaggerated, but that's for the Russians to judge because they regard it as a threat and you can, we tend to say, the MOD tends to say that the Russians are faking it. It's not really a threat. We know it's not a threat. So you just, do you just trash uh, no, the answer? So what do you do? No, well, this is another Revive thing. Revive INF? This is, uh, first, you, you, certainly don't, you certainly don't scrap INF. Yep. Uh, but that's over. You don't okay. scrap the ABN treaty. That's over and done with. Yeah. Uh, you could talk, and this is where I'd agree with Domitilla, I think the whole arms control, if you want me to make a specific recommendation, yeah, yes, it will be to do what we can, and I think do what we're going to have to do, which is revive some version of the arms control dialogue, uh, because the dangers are still there for both sides. Are we talking dialogue or trialogue? Because there's, well, there's a lot there, of talk there, about a multilateralizing think, disarmament negotiations you know, involving the I, Chinese. There is. And that, that's, I think, where the complications come in. Because the point about the Cold War, which has been made many times, is that it was rather simple. Yeah. And it was, uh, it, it was there was uh, two superpowers, and there were people who tugged their forelock behind them on both sides for a variety of reasons. So it was a simple, you could have a dialogue. And the Americans and the Russians did have a dialogue on those, I think, for all of us, supremely important things. I do not see how you can organize a trialogue. Um, there will come a point when the Chinese can match the Russian and uh, American strategic arsenal. And at that point, everybody will have to find out some way of constructing a dialogue. I think it's too soon. OK, fair enough. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, one of, the, one of the beauties about this subject is that it's just going to run on and on and on. So we look forward to seeing you perhaps uh, for next year's Russia debate. But in the meantime, I'd like you to join me in thanking our wonderful panelists, Sir Roderick Braithwaite, Aglaya Snyatkov, Domitila Sagramoso, and Edward Lucas.